I've had this question in my mind. How do I figure out the calculus behind that five minutes so that I never miss it? And when I see it, maybe I'm not just wooed by somebody who can tell a good joke, but I'm looking for clear markers that God has shown. I believe, you know, the Holy Spirit can do whatever He wants to do, but I believe He moves in patterns. And so I love looking for the patterns of how people behave, the people He uses the most, follow the same habitual patterns. And that's what we uncovered in the book and, and then realized this could be a great tool for anyone who wants to get ahead. It could be a great tool for a team leader who wants to develop a team full of people. What, what would happen if at your church this weekend, somebody walked in for the first time and every staff and volunteer person they ran into said, they said, man, within five minutes, I wanted to know them. I wanted to be around. Think of the magnet for Jesus you could create if you had a whole core of those people out there as your front line when people come to see what church is all about. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Grow Leader Podcast, where we grow leaders that grow churches by helping them reach their full potential. My name is Matt. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Hey, if you live anywhere near Dallas, Texas, Springfield, Missouri, Canton, Ohio, Denver, Colorado, or Miami, Florida, the Grow Leader team is coming to see you soon in the year of 2024. For more information about our regionals and how you can attend and be a part of them, go to growleader.com. Right now, we're going to jump in on a conversation between Pastor Chris and William Vanderblumen, the author of Be the Unicorn. We think you're going to love it. Let's jump in. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us for this mid-month bonus content at the Grow Leader Podcast. And today, I have one of my dearest ministry friends who has dare I say, contributed more to the body of Christ in ways that you don't even know, because he is uh, helping churches, has for a long time, helped churches find staff and lead pastors. And I met him years ago at an event with John Maxwell. I am so delighted for you today to meet my dear friend, William Vanderblomen. What'd you say, my friend? Hey, man, how you doing, Chris? I'm doing very, very well. Yeah. Well, welcome to the podcast, and you're one of the yeah. smartest guys I, uh, in my whole uh, group of friends as well. You should get out more. <laughs> well, they're going to find that out, that I'm actually very right in just a second, because William just released a brand new book that I want to talk about that you and I were talking about long before the book came out, because as you were helping churches find staff, uh, you were trying to find what makes an exceptional leader that you called it at the time. I don't know if you still do that 1%. What do the 1% have in common? And so last year, I actually brought you to one of our Grow Leader roundtables and we co-led it. And the, and, the, and the guys and the gals that were at this roundtable that we did loved, by the way, they loved having you there mm -hmm. because all of this isn't just your your guess, this is not your, you know, your hunch. This is all data-driven stuff. So I can't wait to get uh, into the book today. It's called Be the Unicorn. I want everybody to go pick up a copy. 12 Data-Driven Habits That Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest of the Leaders. But before we get into the book, William, tell them a little bit about what you do. Yeah, well, uh, I was uh, first a senior pastor for about 15 years in the Presbyterian world, which is a very small part of the vineyard. Yeah. But uh, in that little small part, I pastored one of our larger churches. I tell people that's about as important as being like mayor of a big town in Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's about it. But it was, it was a good-sized church. You had about 5,000 adults, a couple thousand that is kids, very big. And school, yeah. and that sort of thing. And it was there, it got there way too early. I was way under-experienced. Frank, frankly, the church should have used a search firm uh, instead of hire me, but uh, they, they, there wasn't such a thing. And uh, fast forward, went into the business world for a brief period of time. While I was in this Fortune 200 company, the CEO who'd done a marvelous job, he said, it's time to find my successor. And they don't have like Highlands College and, you know, it's a, <laughs> corporate world's a totally different thing. It's just, let's go find the next guy, right? And they hired this thing called a search firm. And 90 days later, they had their next CEO, and he did a great job. And I'm like, wow. Because, frankly, Pastor Chris, you and your tribe have this down a whole lot better than most of the body of Christ. You wow. all are fantastic at training your own pipeline, building from within the house, right. 
all the things that I think just really honor Jesus. And so I, I don't in any way want people to walk away saying, well, we'll just hire somebody out. No, raise your own leaders. Uh, but in the Presbyterian world, at, I was at First Presbyterian Houston, uh, they took almost three years to find me. Wow. And, <laughs> and I'm not that hard to find. Now, I was in Alabama. It's kind of hard to find things there. But uh, uh, <laughs> Watch it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <we're, laughs> but but uh, uh, I left, and then it took them almost three years to find my successor. Wow. And everybody thought that was normal. Hmm. And, and in fact, the church was a really great church. John Maxwell, a mutual friend and mentor to us, uh, came and preached for me once. He said, I've never seen more C-suite corporate leadership in a church than here. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not dumb people. They just didn't have a mechanism for going out and finding the next. So I, I came home and Adrian and I had just gotten married. We just blended our families. This was forever ago. And uh, brand new house. We could barely afford six kids. And I said, baby, I think, I think I'm supposed to quit my job and start something new for churches. And, and she looked at me, and she just said, that's because churches love new ideas, right? <laughs> <laughs> and off we went. And, and that was the fall of 2008, which was just a brilliant time to quit your job and start yeah. something new for churches. But uh, God's been good, and, and 15 years later, we've gotten to work all over the world with some of the finest leaders we've ever seen. We are kind of like the... The, we're kind of like the sound guy at church. You only know about him if he has a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we sort of fly under radar and get to serve in a way that's humbling and, uh, and just a real honor. And I, I appreciate you having me here today. Well, you've been involved in some churches. I won't name the names, but you've been involved in some churches that if I said the name of the church, everyone would know. And you got, you've really become, I would think, the, the go-to guy when it comes to uh, searches for, especially for lead pastors and for staff. So I honor you, my friend. I think you've done a great Thank job you. and you've really helped the body of Christ. You've added a lot to it. But obviously in the middle of all of uh, this process of, I think you've done more than 30,000 face-to-face interviews. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So you That's have right. all this experience about what the talent pool is looking like, what churches need and if we are building our own leadership pipelines or developing our own leaders, which we should be doing, there's a certain type of person, there's a characteristic, a quality that you've discovered that separate, I call it the people pile. How do you, how do you get yourself out of the people pile? That's right. And, and we do right. it through some things that are not just God-given. They're not just things that, well, you know, well, I just, he can preach, I can't, or she can sing and I can't. No, no, no. These are things that you can choose to do. These are qualities and distinctives that you can choose to do. And that's, that's, that's the, the gist of the book. Introduce the book, where it came from. And this, I want us to dive into a couple of these qualities. Can't do all 12 in the time that we have. I want people to get the book. But, 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 but tell us where the book idea came from. Yeah, well, you know, having written, written, books are no fun to write, and you don't make any money writing them. So it better be a message you think needs to get out there, right? right. And, and I have forever wondered why, and you've had this happen before, I'm sure everybody listening has. You run into somebody, and within five minutes, you're like, this one's, this one's different. This one's special. And you're ready to sign up for their blog and do the podcast and the whole, like, all the things. Right. What are they doing to me or what is the Holy Spirit doing or what is happening in that five minutes that's setting off these alarm bells? And how do I prevent from missing the telltale signs of somebody? Because some people are so stinking humble, they fly under the radar. When you and I met, I I had a great time meeting you. I had no idea what God was going to do through you and it totally flew by me. I'm like, I don't ever need to miss that again. Why don't you even tell them the truth that you said... Uh, good luck. Come on, tell them that story. <laughs> well, I, I had been pastoring in Montgomery and had just moved to Houston. And uh, our friend John Maxwell was having a fundraiser for his developed leaders worldwide. And both of us were there uh, trying to help that along. And John pulled me over the tee box and said, hey, I want you to meet my friend Chris. I said, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, Chris is about to plant a church in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And you, you were in Montgomery, right? And I said, yeah. And I said, that's awesome, man, or something like that. And, I, like, I remember running through the traps, knowing a little bit about it. And I'm like, how much family do you have in Alabama? You said, mm, none. Oh, you, you, oh, okay, you got any good friends in Birmingham? Nope. 
<laughs> and I was just like, well, <laughs> you know, good luck, buddy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you were so humble that you, I think, flew under a whole lot of people's radar. And now look what God's done. And yeah. I don't want to miss that. When I'm helping a church find a pastor, I don't want to run across a candidate because there's so much more humble right. than others. I would miss it. So I've had this question in my mind. How do I figure out the calculus behind that five minutes so mm -hmm. that I never miss it? And when I see it, maybe I'm not just wooed by somebody who can tell a good joke, but I'm looking for clear markers that God has shown. I believe, you know, the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants to do, but I believe he moves in patterns. And so I love looking for the patterns of how people behave. The people he uses the most follow the same habitual patterns. And that's what we uncovered in the book and, and then realized this could be a great tool for anyone who wants to get ahead. It could be a great tool for a team leader who wants to develop a team full of people. What, what would happen if at your church this weekend, somebody walked in for the first time and every staff and volunteer person they ran into said, they said, man, within five minutes, I wanted to know him. I wanted to be Think of the magnet for Jesus you could create right. if you had a whole core of those people out there as your front line when people come to see what church is all about. So how did you do the data? I mean, how did you figure this out? Yeah, well, I, I decided we'd have a pandemic. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, you know, we had this little thing in 2020. And, and uh, I don't know if you noticed, but churches weren't really hiring then. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and so I, I didn't go to business school. I've got a religion and philosophy degree from Wake Forest, and a seminary degree from Princeton. <laughs> I don't know how to run a P&L or didn't. And uh, I did learn during the pandemic, if every one of your clients closes indefinitely, your schedule is going to clear up pretty quick. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we had some time, and, and we sat back, and we did a lot of things. We tried to serve churches, but we also said, what can we learn from what we've done so far? And I, I love, you taught me this, uh, be an opportunist. Right. Like, when the opportunity's there, take it. It's not about having the big plan. It's about being ready for the opportunity. And so we tried to seize the opportunity of the pandemic and work on things we had not worked on before. And one of them was... When we do a search, we do lots of interviews, but the very best in a search, get a long face-to-face -face interview, about two or three hours long. It's not a cookie cutter, but it follows a pattern. Okay. And we take copious notes, and I've had really detail-oriented people file all those notes and every message and every call. And, all the, and so we said, oh, we've now done 30,000 of these face-to-face -face long interviews with people who are the best of the best. Do they have anything in common? Is God ready to show us a pattern of yeah. what they are, how they're wired, and maybe it's what they behave? And, 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 and the research came out really clear, and it was a total shock. I, I, it wasn't anything I thought it'd be. Yeah, I remember when you uh, shared the qualities. I was taking notes in the round table, and even the first one, and I, wanna, I want you to tackle this first one. I think at the time you were calling it, calling it responsiveness. I think in the book you call it fast. But just, that's right. Yeah, just talk about that one, because that's the one that shocked me the most. You said that one of the greatest qualities that a leader possesses is their ability, as how fast they respond to someone's inquiry. Unpack that a little bit. Yeah, fast and intentional. I, I, you know, the problem with writing a book is by the time it comes out, you're ready to rewrite it because you've thought about the material more. But, but what we found was the unicorns, the one percenters, the best of the best, are almost obsessed with getting back to people as quickly and intentionally as they can. And then by contrast, and this is true of all 12 of the habits, it, they're just almost bent toward doing that, responding. Most everybody else ain't. Right. Like, we as a human race are really, really bad at getting back to people. And, and when we do, it's not intentional, and it's late, and it's lazy. And we studied sales and marketing cycles and how salespeople are just throwing opportunities away by waiting too long to respond. We, we looked at first-time donors in church. How do you convert them to a long-term donor? Quickest way is to text that donor on the day they gave. The preaching pastor doing the texting is even the best. Wow. So, so what we found was if you will respond to people quickly and intentionally, you will stand out in the crowd. I'm willing to wager part of why we're recording this today is that very dynamic. Hmm. That's right. 
That's exactly right. I remember I took the notes from the time you were with us. I'm going to read it to the, uh, the audience. You said that if we respond after 24 hours, there was a less than 1% return rate on that inquiry. Right. If you could get it down to 20 minutes response, you would get 60% who would take the next step. And if by any stretch you could actually respond to somebody within 60 seconds, it goes up to a 98% likely return for them to take a second step. And so when you told us that as a, as, uh, in the round table, I took this straight to my team and I actually put together a responsiveness uh, committee of my wow. leaders. And I said, I, go, I want us to go through the entire organization and I want, us, I want you to measure how fast we are doing things or how slow we're doing things and ask ourselves, can we increase our responsiveness? And, and I'm going to tell you, William, um, that one thing alone this past year in 2023 made a huge difference in mm. the, just the way we serve people here at Church of the Highlands, including um, uh, how we formed this app and all these different tools. Tell us a couple of ideas, just like this is the Grow Leader podcast. So help a church who's listening right yeah. now. If they say, okay, I want to be responsive, but I'm not really, give me an example. What, what, what would you think right off the top of your head? Well, let's go back to first-time donors, because this shocked me. And, and some of our friends in fundraising showed me the data behind this. It's just shocking. If you want to convert a first-time donor into a regular donor, statistically, the best thing you can do is have the person who was preaching on the day they gave the gift send a message on the day of the gift in a text format. Now, five years ago, that would have sounded incredibly invasive to me. Right. But now people want to hear that. And if you respond intentionally within a minute of getting that data, man, all it changes everything. I, I, I used to call every... Back when we used visitor cards, I know some people still do, and they fill out the information. By the time they fill out that information, they're not a first-time guest. And, and if you fill it out and turn it in, and the preaching pastor calls you that afternoon, unbelievable. When I moved to Houston, I filled out all these cards for 10 different churches I visited, and you'd know every one of them if I uh, rattled them off. They're wonderful churches. I even left a, a, a cash gift for the pastor <laughs> in with the card. And out of those 10, one church reached back to me. It was Lakewood. It was the only one. And, and I don't fault those other churches. I'm just saying, if you will respond, you will stand out of the crowd even more than people who are well-known or have big ministries. All you have to do is get back to people. And, and let me just stress, the more intentional your response the farther you're going to go, because they're going to be fast responses in the next five years. They're all going to be done by AI. Yeah. But when a human hears from another human, man, that's going to make a difference. Yeah. Responsiveness wins. Okay. I have a couple more I want you to unpack, but what is your favorite one? Like, what is the one that surprised you the most of the 12? And, yeah. And well, we, yeah. The, the speed or, or fast, uh, I learned when we started our business, it helped me, because if I didn't get back to people, we didn't eat. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and I just did it. And then I found, oh, man, nobody else does. So that was really confirming. I think one of the more interesting uh, habits and, and, and really intentional choice of the word habit here. This is not a trait. Right. You, you don't walk away and say, I wasn't born with it. I can't do that. Every one of these is a basic habit of how you treat other humans. That's and great. it will cause you to rise out of the crowd. The one that... that really caught my attention was self-awareness. Okay, talk about that right. a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, we, so we have all these 30,000 unicorns. We surveyed them all, you know, on all the trade. We wanted to find out what they think and what they do to do better. We, in fact, probably a third of the book is them quoting us about how they practice these habits. Okay. okay? Um, when we surveyed the unicorns and we asked them to force rank, which one are you best at, which one are you worst at? In last place, by a mile, was self-awareness. And they said that about themselves. And they said that about themselves, <laughs> and they're the best of the best. Now, let's flip it around. Okay. We also went and surveyed 250,000 normal people, right? And we asked similar questions. One of the things we asked was, we introduced each of the habits, and we said, scale one to five, how, how would you rank yourself? You know, three being average, and five being woo, and one being a whoo. Okay, 91% of everybody ranked themselves as above average in self-awareness. So the ones that actually aren't self-aware thought they were, and the ones that actually were said they weren't. 
or are working on it. <laughs> or working on you know, it. I think, of, I think of Paul, not to not to geek out and go former pastor on you, but I, ch- <laughs> I did a lot of work in Galatians in seminary. And, and I'm convinced, and I think most scholars are convinced, it was one of his very first letters. Yeah. Okay? Think about how he starts that letter. Paul, an apostle, <laughs> called by God, not by men. Now, that's a man that does not have self-esteem problems right, right there. Right. Like he's, you know, you get into his later writings and his latest writing, I would say, and how does he refer to himself? I'm the chief of all sinners. Yeah. The longer we walk with Jesus, the longer we develop our skills, the more we realize how much work we have to do. And it just revolutionized my thinking. You know, I, I've told secular audiences, you hear Jesus said, well, don't worry about the splinter in your brother's eye until you worry about the log in your own. I think what Jesus might have been saying was, until you deal with your own stuff, you're nearly not going to be able to help anybody with theirs. And I'd never heard it that way. Wow. But self-awareness, I, in fact... If these 12 habits were an archway, I'd say self-awareness is the keystone. Wow. If you could focus on one thing the rest of your life to get better at, if you get that right, the rest of them will start to take care of themselves. So tell us about a, a particular person that you interviewed or you, that was really the unicorn of all unicorns and talk to us about their self-awareness traits and how they projected that and how you knew that was one of their qualities. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the unicorn of all unicorns in self-awareness, okay? okay. In that one... Okay. And this is just what pops in my mind, okay. right? This is who comes out. There are plenty of other ones. I don't want to leave, leave people out. But uh, I, years ago, PC, it was probably 12, 13, 14 years ago. I mean, I, this will be 16th year doing this, so early on. I was doing a youth pastor search for a church. And part of what we do is help people find, you know, the right list. And then part of it is make sure that these people are actually who they say they are. Right. So we got to dig and scour and like, you know, not what your mama say, but what'd your mother-in-law say about you, right, right. you know, like that. <laughs> so oh, I, I never knew how to ask the question, do you have, hey, is there a skeleton in the closet? You know, this kind of thing. And right. I tried to be all theological and I, I was interviewing this 25-year-old kid. And I, I wasn't even old enough to be a mister and he was calling me Mr. Vanderbilt. And uh, I said, uh, hey, Chris, do you, you know, better get things on the table now than later. Are there any moral failures in your past <laughs> that we need to discuss? And that kid looked at me and he said, Mr. Van Bluen, I am a moral failure. Wow. wow. And he said, that's, that's why I trust Jesus. I'm like, I just got theologically juked by a 25-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> I got a Princeton degree. I didn't... <laughs> but that is self-awareness. Mm. Where, and I think in today's world, where I see it most frequently is people who are talking about what they're learning rather than what I should be doing. And, and I, I don't oh, know if wow. you've seen that in communication from the stage, but I'm on a journey and I'm learning this. That shows some self-awareness. And, and then you can go ahead and say, and Jesus says we ought to be doing this, this, and this. But there's just a, a, once you start looking for it, you see people who are doing self-examination before proclamation. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's so good. Is, is there anything, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the people who are listening right now that are saying, man, I want to be that. What, what, is, what is a go-to practice to develop that yeah. habit? Well, you know, there's so many layers to this. If, you know, if you're working through your stuff, some people need like professional go see somebody right, kind of thing. Right. I'm not that guy, right? But I do think we live in a pretty amazing era of being able to discover yourself. And, and what I mean when I say that is for 20 bucks, you can take the disc inventory. Right. You, you can go take the Enneagram. There, I mean, take them all. We, we even built one. I don't think I told you this. Out of the 12 habits, we built an inventory for people to take. Here are my top three. Here are the three I need to work on. And you can read the book whatever order you want so you can, you can build your oh, own development so plan right there. Uh, so I would, I would do anything you can to figure out how am I wired. Because, you know, it, it, here's how this changes your world. You're interviewing for a job at, call it Church of the Highlands, because for whatever reason, all the graduates at Highland College were going to do something else, right? And, and uh, you're interviewing me or, or, or someone else, and they say, William, we're interviewing you for this uh, evangelism position. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> okay, here's what I'm learning about myself. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. That means I love the next party. 
Yeah. I just love a party. I love the dinner parties Jesus threw, was at and converted people. That's a big deal to me. I also know you're really high growth. I mean, amazing growth, which probably means every job description has other duties as necessary on it, and things pivot, and they shift, and they zig, and they zag. I am an ID on the disc. Yeah. I thrive in those environments. My first job, I was supposed to build a marketing campaign. We had an email list of five people. And it took me a while, and I had to figure out different tools to use, but we grew that thing up to 20,000 email addresses and used it regularly, and we had to figure it out on the fly and other duties as necessary. I love that environment, and that's why I'm excited about interviewing with you. That's so good. That's so good. All right. Uh, I want to I, I tackle another one that was one of my favorite at the roundtable you gave, and that is problem solving. You said that, that what the unicorns have is this absolute hell-bent determination to be on the solution side of a problem, that they get out of the victim mentality and they just say, no, 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 there's a solution to this. Unpack that that's one right. for a little bit, because I think that's so important, especially heading into a brand new year. Lord knows we're going to face some challenging things. And I would totally agree that these are some of the most attractive people that come to me, not just with the problem, but, but they're ready to tackle the solution. Unpack that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, well, I, I have an, a mentor that I think you learned some from as well. I'll leave his name out, but... Uh, he told me a long time ago, he said, William, people are either on the problem side of an equation or the solution side. And most people live on the problem side. Right. The way I say it is most people prefer Eeyore to Tigger. I like Tigger. Yeah. <laughs> I want to have the answer. Let's, let's move forward. I think, of, uh, I don't know if you remember Lloyd Benson. He was a senator. He yeah, was the vice absolutely. president. Yeah. Yeah. So he was in our church and uh, he died. I had to do the funeral and I actually had to speak after President Clinton at the funeral. That's not a Wow. <laughs> That's like the short straw to draw. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, looking for stories, and B.A. was telling me, her, his wife, they were 25 years old. They moved into South Texas. He was county judge, uh, just been elected. And this family showed up, a, a lat young Latino man and woman, and then the woman's daddy right behind him. And he looked at the daddy, looked at him and said, these two need to get married right now. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you had a shotgun or not, but that was it. And, and B.A. says, uh, you know, he didn't send him anywhere else. He looked around, and he found what he needed, and they put together a service right there. She said, you know, it had, like, all kinds of weird stuff in it. But it was, She said it's the only wedding she's ever been to where the couple had to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he got it done. It's yeah. that kind of thinking. Not, oh, what's the problem? oh, what happened to me, it's, oh, what's the solution, right? Yep. And this is the sign of a redeemed person. Mm -hmm. you, know, you think back to the very beginning in the fall, how'd this happen? Well, that woman you gave me, she made me do it. Well, that snake, the one you created, they made me do it. And, and with redeemed right. people or in, on the other side of redemption, it's a whole different thing. You, you, you think... I love you taught me the principle of firsts, yeah. right? The first place something's mentioned, you should pay attention. And like, I think the first question, you know, God asks yep. is, where are you mm. when he's looking for us, when we're lost? But you get on the other side of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and what's the very first question that happens? Where is he? Mm. The wise men looking for him. Yep. There's something that shifts in the believer's head when they realize the tomb is empty. Yeah. The solutions are where we need to be living, not the problems. And when you find people like that, they don't even have to be, you know, they, didn't, they might not know they're Christian yet, but they're going to be. Yeah. Because <laughs> people who love solutions love an empty tomb. Yeah, that is so good, my friend. The book is called Be the Unicorn, 12 Data-Driven Habits That Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest. Where, where can they find the book? They can, well, my last name's messed up. You can just try and spell Vanderbloom in Amazon or Google, <laughs> and it'll, it'll, it'll pop up. There is a domain. It's got some bonus content and things like that. It's called theunicornbook.com. Theunicornbook.com. And I want everyone the listening to go to it. There's extra resources as well. And if they want to get, uh, uh, have your services for, for staffing and things like that, talk to them about that in, for about a minute. Yeah, well, you know, hopefully you're building your own staff, and hopefully this will be a tool that helps you. Good. Um, we do have on our website, which is just vanderblumen.com, because my last name is messed up, and seriously, just type it however you want. There are, I think we just crossed the mark, there are 4,000 free resources on that website to help you build and run and keep a great team. Wow. The things they never taught me in seminary, the, you know, the knowledge gap between 
what you know in the Bible and what you got to do to run a team. So go use that. Take it. There's a couple of podcasts with PC that are super helpful in there. Uh, and if you find yourself needing some help or consultation or even compensation, this kind of thing, you can find it on the website, vanderblumen.com. But first and foremost, take the free stuff. Use it. We're here to help you. You're so kind, so generous. The Forge, written by John Maxwell, Be the Unicorn, 12 Data-Driven Habits That Will Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest. Every pastor or leader, mom, dad that's listening, this is a great way to develop yourself and the leaders around you. And I want you to go get the book. William, thank you for joining me today, my friend. Thanks, PC. It's always an honor to be with you. God bless you, sir. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And we also want to say a big thank you to all of our partners that help make the Grow Leader podcast happen each and every month. The first is Compassion International. For over 70 years, they have served the most vulnerable children in the world in Jesus' name. Through the power of the local church, they've impacted over 2.3 million children, and they're not stopping anytime soon. Learn more about how you can be a part of what they're doing at compassion.com slash grow leader. The next is our newest partner, Studio C. Studio C can help you know your people and grow your church. They combine strategy, technology, and communications to maximize church member engagement. You can bridge the engagement gap and transform your church's impact with Studio C. Learn more about them at their website. It's thestudioc.org slash grow leader. And finally, A big thank you to the Wesleyan Investment Foundation. For over 80 years, the Wesleyan Investment Foundation has helped churches with their borrowing and their investing needs. Whether you're dreaming of a new opportunity or seeking wise counsel about resource management, WIF can assist you. You can learn more about them at wifonline.com slash growleader.